great pleasure and also a honor for me to introduce to you uh, Anne-Marie Turtlebaum, member of the Court of Auditors. Now, uh, Mr. Turtlebaum has a very long and most impressive uh, CV. It would take undue time to go through all the details, but let me say that um, Mrs. Turtlebaum has uh, accumulated over her career quite a number of firsts, of first occasions, of first opportunities. Uh, she has been the first federal Belgian minister with responsibility for migration and asylum from 2008 to 2009. Then she has been the first female minister of interior in Belgium from 2009 to 2011 and also the first Minister of Justice in Belgium who has not been a lawyer by background. This makes already a lot of uh, impressive uh, uh, firsts. Uh, I would just like to add, she is adding a first this evening because this is the first time that students of the college are addressed by a member of the Court of Auditors. So you are continuing uh, the tradition of being the first. I would also like to mention that Mrs. Turtlebaum has had uh, very senior political responsibilities in the Flemish government as a vice uh, uh, prime minister and minister of finance of Flanders from 2014 to 2016. And since this year, she has a new responsibility at the Court of Auditors. I'm uh, very pleased that she has accepted to address us this evening on the subject of the rule of law and the EU budget. I think it's a very relevant and innovative subject also here at the, at the college. Uh, I think uh, the Court of Auditors sometimes is not fully appreciated in terms of its importance. I remember that I occasionally, when I was still teaching, used reports of the Court of Auditors and had to convince uh, in the first place, my students, and that this was far from only of technical importance, that there were very fundamental political issues touched upon by the reports of the Court of Auditors. I would like to mention that since July of this year, we have a partnership agreement with the Court of Auditors, and Mr. Turtlebaum helped a lot with bringing this result about, which also provides for a price for the best thesis in the domain to be attributed to a student of the college and for cooperation on training and, and research. Uh, when I visited the court uh, this summer, I also had a little surprise because the court was kind enough to have called together uh, alumni of the college working at the Court of Auditors. And uh, not everyone could come, but I was impressed enough to see that in the little room where they were waiting for me, there were 16. So there are quite a few of, uh, of uh, your colleagues, so to say, who are um, uh, helping the Court of Auditors with this task. And maybe uh, the surely inspiring speech we will listen to will convince some of you also to consider a career at the Court of Auditors. Maybe I'm going to, a bit too fast uh, with that, but I would also like uh, to say this. Mrs. Turtlebaum, it's my pleasure to ask you now forward. I have just to uh, explain to you as well, as I explained already to you, that I have unfortunately to slip out briefly during the lecture because uh, we have a video meeting with the Fletcher School, which is important for the accreditation of our MATA program in the United States. And because of the uh, time decalage, uh, it just coincides with this uh, meeting here, and I will have to slip out for a couple of minutes. So apologies to you, but also to you, if I cause some uh, upheaval when leaving. This turtle bomb, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear rector. And uh, as always, you are too kind, too polite when you give the introduction on my career. It's true that I did uh, some uh, topics for the first time in the history of my country. But as you, if you search long enough, you can always find that also in your careers. But I'm very happy. I'm very pleased to see that there is almost as much many as many men as women here in the room i think it's also very important maybe 
Uh, I cannot exclude that at a certain moment during my explanation, I give some very feministic talk. It just don't feel uh, upset uh, about that, but it's a little bit because I always think, I'm always thinking that if it took my country 185 years to find the women to become Minister of Home Affairs, I think there is still some room for improvement for some feministic talk. But thank you very much here for uh, this invitation. I'm very pleased to give here this talk at the College of Europe today, because I know that this is a very unique institution with a very specific goal, um, but I think a very necessary institution, certainly nowadays with the European dynamics as we know them. And as you can see on, uh, as the title of my presentation, why the rule matters for the EU budget. And I took this title, first of all, because I'm a member of the Court of Auditors. We are the guardians, as our baseline says, the guardians of the EU's taxpayers' money on one hand. But on the other hand, it's also interesting because if we talk about rule of law, we often think immediately about uh, judicial consequences, are judges independent, and I was a Minister of Justice, so I know that it's very important for a country to have independent courts. But linking it, and why it is also important for the EU budget, is to me a little bit an underestimated aspect of the rule of law. But before I start, I give you a little bit the outline of my presentation. I will go, first of all, a bit in the definition of the rule of law, not too much. Then I will talk about what are the different perspectives, the theoretical one, the historical one, the political one, the financial one. And then I will come to a new proposal of the European Commission that they proposed at the beginning of May. And then our opinion that is uh, trying to improve that proposal of the European Commission because actually that is mainly the aim of the European Court of Auditors that we also at a certain moment give recommendations <coughs> to improve the legislation. And then I will come briefly at the end on the memorandum of, of understanding, but I can tell you already now that it's a fantastic institution where I work. We have a fantastic lookout position over Europe. So I'm strongly recommending you to be a candidate for the prize, one of the first prize, the first time that we have a memorandum of understanding between the College of Europe and the Court of Auditors, because it's an, an interesting place, certainly if you want to have an interesting uh, an, a European career. But to start about, and I already said it a little bit, what is actually the definition of the rule of law? And I will not go too deeply in that definition as there is a wide variety of definitions. If you look to the way in which economists uh, uh, talk about rule of law, they say actually it's limited to property rights and to contract enforcement. That's it is. If rule of law, if your contract agreements are um, accepted, are uh, followed, then it's totally fine. Of course, lawyers give a much broader definition to the rule of law, and they also say it's binding a community together. It's helping, it's protecting individuals against the government. It's protecting fundamental individual rights, human rights in a society. So you see already there is, uh, in the academic world, if you want to have to, write, to read 20 or 200 pages about several definitions of rule of law, I can give you them, but it will, would bring us a little bit too far today. Furthermore, the definition is also continuum. If you say, see at a certain moment that the first time that the rule of law started in Britain was with the Magna Carta in 1215, of course, this means that the definition that they gave at that moment or the practical implementation of that definition will be in 2018 not anymore ex the same. You have also an equivalent is France, l'état du droit, is also Germany with the Rechtsstaat, um, and is in my country the joyous entry um, in 1356, which was actually also at that moment the start of the first time that they talked about the rule of law. But for me, I try to talk about it in a very practical way. And that means to me that for me in a society, it guarantees you as an individual 
for, and I know that this definition is also, you can, you can, you can also contest this definition, but I try to give a practical implementation of it, is first of all, that you will not get arrested arbitrarily. That second, that your property rights will be respected no matter what your political opinions are. Third, that you can reasonably plan your future and make your own choices on your own life. And fourth, that you can live in a flourishing environment for human creativity and initiative. And that's the reason, actually, why Europe is not only a, an economic union, but it's also an, 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 a union of human values or fundamental values. And that's the reason Article 1 of the Treaty of Lisbon talks about we are going to establish a European, an econo a European Union. And the second article, it's not Article 20, not Article 30, not Article 50, but it's Article 2 that talks about rule of law. The union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and the respect of human rights, and so on, and so on. So it's a very important, and that's also the reason why nowadays it's such an important topic. If we talk about Europe, we all, of course, we talk a lot about Brexit, but we also, the second largest topic is the rule of law because it touches the fundamental pillars of the European Union. So I leave a little bit the definition where it is, and I go a little bit to the political perspective. And of course, then I start with the general will, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and I think you all know from your political science classes um, that uh, here is installed what is actually a government. It should be based on a democracy. And what is a democracy? That is at a certain moment that you have free elections, fair elections, but that out of that democracy, they install a majority, and the majority is 50 plus one. And due to Rousseau, he says, if you have a majority, you can do whatever you want. I make a little bit, I make a little bit of shortcut, but to, to, to make it very clear. But of course, if you reach at 50 plus one, I have to say that democracy is, in the will of the majority, not enough. In a liberal democracy, where the rule of law is respected, the majority, this majority means only a license to govern, a license to elaborate the will of the majority, political decisions, but it's never a blank check to do as you like. And I took another quote. It was too tempting not to take Margaret Thatcher here at the, at the College of Europe. I know that she gave an amazing speech here, amazing, contested, difficult speech. I leave that speech where it is. But she said in this quote, spot on, being democratic is not enough. A majority cannot turn what's wrong into right. In order to be considered truly free, countries must also have a deep love of liberty and respect of the rule of law. And I fully agree with this definition. Because actually in a democracy, a government majority can change every four or five years. So, it is also a temporary period. So in that temporary period, if you are at that moment a member of a minority, also your rights have to be protected, need to be protected. And actually, if you read this, then you have really the definition of a liberal democracy where you guarantee the rights of a minority, but where you also say, as a government, you have the support of a majority, but the main aim is to take into account that schools are built, that the infrastructure works, and so on, and so on. It's not a blank check to do whatever you want to do. And I took this picture of uh, this slide of the Gruning Museum next door, because there you actually see what is the result of rule of law. If you have liberty, if you have freedom, you can have economic wealth, you can have prosperity, and if you have a rule of law, you can also, it will always give in a result the most amazing art because you only can have a flourishing art scene if you have prosperity, but also if you are free to think 
and to act as you want. And it's out of that creativity you see these amazing pictures. And I can strongly recommend you to go to that museum because it's actually for a certain period in our history the most amazing, most beautiful art that we can offer you, Flemish art, Belgium Dutch art, that we can offer here. And you can be proud that it's next to your institution. And if I talk about rule of law, I can also give like a negative example. If you take here behind the curtain and we compare with Russia, then I have to say that the Cold War ended the way it did, not because they were bankrupted economically, not because they did not have natural resources and human resources. They all had that. But it collapsed because there was a lack of moral existence. And all the time, if you have a democracy that's based on the rule of 50 plus 1 without the rule of law, it is an unstable, unsustainable system. And that's the reason why it is also so prominent and dominant in the um, uh, Treaty of Lisbon. If I go to the political perspective, of course, it's almost an obligation to take a quote of one of the founding fathers, Jean Monnet here. And he stated very well that the EU is a community based on the rule of law. Independent courts at national and international and European level are entrusted with watching of the respect of our jointly agreed rules and regulations and of their implementation in all the member states. And now you can say, but why is this so important? Well, as you all know, 80% of the EU funds are shared management, shared between European Commission, European institutions, and on the other hand, the member states. How can I, can we as a European Court of Auditors, as guardians of the EU taxpayers' money, guarantee that if there is a suspicion of fraud, that it will be treated in, it, in an independent way if there is not an independent court and an independent judge. And that's the reason why a little bit underlined till uh, now, why to me, linking the rule of law to the EU budget to guarantee sound financial management is actually so very important. And once again, I compare the European Union with the Soviet Union, am I? Why do I take it? Um, yeah, you know what, if you have people in your communication, who do the communication, you're always very creative in the way in which they present it. Eh? But um, why did I take, uh, why did I took this picture? Because to explain, or why do I want to compare the Soviet Union with the European Union? Because from time to time, from time to time, people say, nationalists or Brexiteers, who said at a certain moment, but hey, the diktat of Brussels, it's almost the diktat of Moscow. I think it's completely wrong. And why is it wrong? Because European Union is made on a totally different basis. It's, it's, it has grown by consent. It has grown by consensus, never by force. And that being said, we have something else that the Soviet Union never had. You can leave. If you think at a certain moment as a member state, that added value of Europe is not big, large enough anymore for your own country, you can leave. And you can say maybe this is a little bit a strange interpretation of a European Union. No, it means that if you respect freedom, if you respect rule of law, if you respect democracy, you also need to have the possibility to leave, hopefully in a proper way, we saw the first results of the Brexit deal, but I think there will be a lot of discussions next um, days and weeks uh, further on. Then finally, coming to the financial uh, point of view. I already said that um, we are so interested as a lot of the EU funds are shared management between European institutions and the member states. And so, actually, if you look at history, it has shown time and again that power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's the reason why if you, are, if you want to protect the taxpayer's money, if you want to protect it, you need to have a very uh, strong installed rule of law to add and to become, to, uh, to have a liberal uh, democracy. 
And at this point, if I go to the topic one, because we don't, we need to talk about the elephant in the room, and we cannot all the time talk about rule of law, European Union, and not pronouncing the words Poland and Hungary, because it's actually at this moment on, the, on these two member states. And then there is, from my point of view, something very interesting. The governments in Poland and Hungary, they never contest the Article 2 in the Treaty of Lisbon. They never contest that there should be a rule of law. There's only one other thing that you, European Commission says at a certain moment, here there are also some alarm bells that start ringing. And why? Because there's an increasing control of media in both countries. The limitations they have been imposing on academic freedom, and I don't need to say here in a college how important the academic freedom is, and how uh, strong it should be that there is a Berlin Wall or that there should be a very strong wall in free thinking of uh, professors and students. Third, the constitutional changes they introduced regarding the appointment of judges and Supreme Court judges. And last but not least, the pace in which they pass these reforms. And all these elements together um, ring, did uh, have set alarm bells ringing at the commission. And that's the reason why they came with a new proposal at the beginning of May. And actually you can say, why did they need a new proposal? Because they already have at this moment two options to punish member states if there is a general deficiency in the rule of law. First option is the infringement procedure that is completely in line with Article 258 of the treaty. It starts with a formal notice to the member states and then a communication phase. And finally, the commission brings the matter before the Court of Justice if the member state doesn't comply with the EU law. So you see commission, member state, Court of Justice, and finally, if they don't comply, they can be punished. A very long procedure where actually there is not very a little margin for a middle way. Second option, the, co the, the European Commission already has, is um, Article 7, and we call it the nuclear option. The fact that we call it a nuclear option says everything. It means that it's also a long procedure, it's another procedure, but in the end, there is a high threshold to decide, they can suspend certain rights of the member states and they go, can go so far that they suspend the voting rights of a member state. But actually, if you suspend the voting rights of a member state, that's a completely rupture in the relationship between the European Commission and the member states. So these two options, they are there. They never link rule of law to European budget, which the third option does. And it are very unflexible mechanism. It takes a lot of time. And as we all know that you have elections every four or five years, it's perfectly possible that, you start, that the commission starts with option one and option two, and it only comes to an end or to a result, maybe when there is already a new government installed. That's the reason why they came with the third option. And that third option says actually links very clear a general deficiency in rule of law to the EU budget. And they say, if in a certain member state there is a lack of rule of law, we can decrease the EU funds in certain areas. We as a court of auditors, and that's a little bit also explaining what we do, there is always an obligation. If the European Commission takes a proposal or sends out a proposal or takes a decision or want to take a decision on something that touches to sound financial management, there is an obligation in the treaty to ask an opinion of the European Court of Auditors. So that we can say, is this actually a proper decision? Because that's also one of the fundamental values within European institutions. We have a lot of checks and balances. If the Commission cannot decide something on their own, there is, at a certain point, also an independent, impartial Court of Auditors who can, um, who can uh, measure uh, these, uh, these uh, proposals. And actually, the new mechanism uh, can freeze EU funds, link it to the rule of law, and it's, if you compare it with the other two procedures, 
a much faster and flexible procedure. So we made our opinion on it. This is uh, one of the quotes out of our opinion. But actually, our opinion had two main remarks. First of all, we welcome the fact that the European Commission takes a proposal like that. It's very legitimate. There is also a legal basis to take a, a, a proposal, to adopt a proposal like that. But of course, we wouldn't be a court of auditors that after our audit work, we also came with some recommendations to improve the proposal of the European Commission. And actually, our first and main remark is that there is not clearly stated in that proposal of the Commission what is that a general deficiency in rule of law? Does that mean that you fire 15% of the judges and you replace them by 15% of the judges who are nominated by the government? Is it quantitative? Is it qualitative? Is it, do you need to have violate five, five rules or only one rule? At a certain point, if you, make to, if you take a decision on a general deficiency in rule of law, Although I already said that there are a wide variety of definitions, you need to be able to express for yourself when is there a general deficiency. And then the Commission says it's not so easy, it's true, but on the other hand, if we take a look at the cooperation and verification mechanism that the Commission installed for Romania and Bulgaria to improve their work in, and to um, improve their work in judicial areas, they are capable to make a definition. It's possible. We also have the checklist of the Council of Europe. We also have the work of the Venice Commission at the Council of Europe. So there is actually already a lot of expertise available to make a clear the definition as now set in uh, the proposal of the European Commission. And then we also had two other remarks. We had, if you want to read everything, the opinion is on the website of the Court of Auditors. But a second opinion was on the final beneficiaries. If you are going to decrease EU funds, yeah, at a certain moment, the funds, they don't go to the government. If it are funds in agriculture, they go to farmers. So if you decrease the budget, then the European Commission says, oh, member states, you have to fill the gap. But of course, the member states, they are also binded by very strong rules budgetary rules on the budgetary management of member states. So you cannot decrease a fund like that, say the final beneficiary cannot be hurt, and you need to fill the gap and stay in line with the strict rules of the European Commission. That is not very clear, very consistent, or should be elaborated in a better way to improve the proposal. So actually, the two other remarks were on how are you going to, to guarantee that the final beneficiary is not hurt? And second, how can you guarantee that the budgetary member, uh, management of the member state is not completely, um, is not any more sustainable and that they cannot follow anymore because otherwise you are a little bit also turning in round with the member states. So we think globally, good initiative but still some room for improvement. And I'm very happy that our opinion was also a part of the discussion at the European Parliament. The European Parliament also came with some suggestions for the European Commission. At this moment, it is still a proposal. It should be approved by the, European, by the Council. And I also hear that there is also there some suggestions to improve the proposal itself. But I'm very proud that I can say we can on one hand say, but due to the fact that we have a lot of checks and balances in our own system, decision-making process is a little bit slower. But on the other hand, it also makes that the checks and balances make that you are, cannot violate a rule, also not an internal rule in uh, Europe. So that is about linking EU budget to the rule of law. I'm very in favor of that because the more I read about that, the more you can only guarantee sound financial management in international institutions if there is also the rule of law is guaranteed in uh, different member states. So that being said, I would like to add two words to you as uh, future European leaders. 
and second, some words on the Memorandum of Understanding. And to the future European leaders, I wanted to say the future is ours to win, but together we can't just stand still. And I wanted to, I think that you will, it could be a possibility that you think that uh, my generation is maybe not as good as you would like us to be, which is true. It's actually, it's a, it's a terrible, um, uh, summary, but it's, I think it's unfortunately also part of history that a next generation should also be, uh, always be more ambitious than the, than the previous generation. So I think I'm convinced that uh, we still have a fantastic project in Europe, the European Union project, and I think if there is one silver lining to take out of the Brexit debate is maybe that if it wouldn't have existed, we should have found it out because I think that we are now all of us convinced that together we are stronger, together we can do more. And I just see, it's, I'm not anymore a politician, but I just see that the debates that started in Italy, in the Netherlands, in some member states, or maybe we can also leave European Union, it's quite still at this moment. It's quite at that front. So maybe it's good that people figure out that it's true that stronger you are, um, stronger together you are uh, better. So, but I think that we still have some challenges to, to face with. If we look to the international order, I think you, there's maybe room not to stay in a vacuum. I think at the international level, a lot of things are evaluating at this moment. And I think there's a lot of room, still more room for Europe to go on that path. And if we think, if we, if we talk about um, the, how divided Eastern and Western Europe is still nowadays, I think there is also a lot of room to do on that side. And certainly at the Court of Auditors, we take also some attention to look to um, infrastructure project. Is there like a geographical balance? Because it's actually, it's very important. But then coming to the last point, and maybe for you the most important point of uh, today, is the Memorandum of Understanding that we concluded between the European Court of Auditors and the College of Europe in Bruges. And I think it's maybe a little bit, it's good that I was the first member of the Court of Auditors who comes here, but maybe we should have done it already before, but that's coming also from our side. Um, and I think that Memorandum of Understanding is actually very clear. We make an award for a best thesis, an award from the European Court of Auditors, and it's on a topic related to the European Court of Auditors. But don't make a narrow definition of it. We are also very open-minded to have like very think out of the box ideas, because I think you have at this moment the best period in your life to come up with think out of, of the box ideas, the older you get, the less you can do it, the, the less you can afford. <laughs> Only if you have drinks with friends, but uh, not in a professional life anymore. So, um, but uh, we give a, a reward for the best thesis, marked 15 out of 20 or higher, on a topic related to the work of the Court of Auditors. Um, what is the award? It's a five month renominated traineeship at the European Court of Auditors. And uh, I have to say, I'm now, at this moment, I'm appointed, I started at the beginning of May, and it's a fantastic institution. It's a fantastic lookout position on uh, European level, as we have the possibility to uh, obtain all the information that we need to, to make a, a, an in-depth analysis if we want to come out with a report, a special report, or our annual report. So we have access to the most interest, to, to all necessary information. And that gives us a quite unique position as a European institution. So I can strongly recommend it. Um, what are we doing? I already said that we are the guardians of the EU taxpayers' money. We contribute to improving the EU financial management. We promote accountability and transparency and we act independent as an independent guardian of the financial interest of the EU citizens. I can only also strongly recommend you Luxembourg. It's a very international city with a lot of culture. 
it's an interest, it's also a financial hub, but okay, we are not here about uh, to talk about that part. So, but I would say, take a look at it. The deadline will be later uh, confirmed, but it will be early May. And we will uh, make a decision in June so that afterwards you can start as soon as possible in our fantastic, um, super interesting, actually the best institution. <laughs> it's from. And it's by definition the best institution because it's the one where I work. So it's always a good definition. So, but thank you very much for your attention. I'm really looking forward to the questions. I hope I can answer all the questions always. Otherwise, there will be a small embarrassing moment, but that's also part of life. So, but I would say the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. So thanks very much, Mrs. Totobun, for your speech. Uh, I have to say Mrs. Totobun is a very optimistic person. Uh, she didn't say it, but she wrote a book uh, which is entitled The Future Can Begin at Any Time. Yes. Um, so, you know, she answered back to Barack Obama, uh, the future is ours. Okay, uh, so the floor is open to question. Uh, it's up to you. Yeah, we have a question here. Hello, thank you for your um, presentation. I have a question about the inquiry of um, Turkey, which was presented, I think, last week, where a rep report was coming out, and they were saying, well, there's a little bit of lack of competence of the auditors, as they didn't get enough access to um, everything that happened there. So I would um, like to know what is your opinion about it, and furthermore, what do you think about the competences of the auditors within the European Union, and if they should be um, enlarged there, or do you think at the present stage, with getting so much information and data you get already, that's fine. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, that access to information is of course crucial for us. And um, the easiest way for someone to try to, uh, that you cannot do your audit work in a proper way is not giving you access to all the data. It's something where we struggle with all the time. I have to say also at this moment, with the G new, new GDPR regulation, we also need to figure out a little bit more that we can guarantee our audit rights. It's true, not only for the report of last week, but also for the other report on Turkey, on the pre-accession fund, the report of I think seven, eight months ago, it was also a little bit a fight. I have to say that mostly, we obtain all the information. Uh, on the, um, the expertise, we have, you know, we have um, a very flexible way to work in that, in that sense, in the sense of we have our, our experts at the Court of Auditors, but if we see at a certain moment that we need some external expertise, we can also put a tender on the market for think tanks or for uh, universities, if we think that we really have a lack of expertise to bring or to come to conclusions in a proper way uh, for our special report. So our, we are quite flexible on that side, which we have to do, because I think that with everything concerning blockchain and also artificial intelligence, we will need other skills in one or two or in five years than we have at this moment that we have nowadays because we is going, who is going to audit at a certain moment the logarithms that, uh, that drives the artificial intelligence? I think there is still there's a lot of work for us to do also on that side. We are not yet there, but I think it will come uh, as fast as possible. So we also try to make our organization, but we have one advantage. It's a rather small organization, so we can organize it in a quite flexible way. Any Another question? question? Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, but I will hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for an exciting I would thank you. Also, like to to inquire a bit about the report on Turkey. Um, as I understand it, what the court of auditors criticized was that there was a program in Turkey where refugees get uh, some money for their credit card, a program of about uh, a billion euro, 
and Turkey won't give the court authorities access to the names of the refugees that uses this money um, with ref reference to their own uh, privacy legislation. Um, do you think that is a problem that the, the court cannot get access to, to that kind of information? Because I would think that if that was in Europe, that sort of information would also be protected. Well, I referred already a little bit to the GDPR regulation, so we also need to, as it is implemented now for several months, we also come up from time to time with practical problems because, of course, we want to guarantee the privacy of individuals, but we also need to be able to do our audit work in a proper way. But actually, if we don't have access to information, we have something, a very strong argument that backfires to institutions and organizations or countries who doesn't want to give us access. That if you write in a report that there is a lack of transparency, it's also blame. Because then, by definition, you try to hide something. And if you try to hide something, it's never a strong argument. Because if you think that you uh, use the money in a proper way, and that everybody may know it, then you are transparent. And if we had at a certain moment, if on the political level, and I'm not anymore a politician, but if at a, a political level, at a certain moment, the debate started on the pre-accession fund, and now the fund for uh, refugees in Turkey, if that political debate started, it will not help with a report that says there's a lack of transparency. That won't help because then the political debate of the, 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 the deal, the agreement itself, or the, pre, the funds itself will be questioned more and more. So, and we do it. If we don't have access to information, we write it in a very clear way down. And we can make the title of a presentation of, of an audit on it, and it always backfires towards the organization and the member state who doesn't want to give us access to information. Was a question? Yes, please. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about uh, what you said before about the uh, rule of law, especially in Poland. What kind of cooperation do you have? So, European Court of Auditors with National Court of Auditors, and for example, the Polish Supreme Audit Office. What kind of cooperation do you have between the institutions? Sorry, can you just repeat because yep. maybe your mic okay. <laughs> um, Yeah, Th uh, what kind of cooperation yeah. do you have uh, with national okay. court of auditors yes. and Correct. Polish one, for example? Yeah. Well, um, we have a network uh, with all the Supreme Audit institutions in the different member states. We meet each other quite uh, on a regular basis. Uh, of course, there is with some audit, supreme audit institutions, there is a closer cooperation than with others. We can also not underestimate that uh, some audit institutions do have other tasks than other audit institutions. Um, uh, so there's, but we, we work quite good together. But something that is, and I'm now wondering if I quote very well, I was, uh, I had uh, a few weeks ago a meeting with uh, the director of INTOSAI, the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions, and actually out of review came that almost 40% of the audit institutions feel that they cannot work independently. It, it was all over the world. Eh? It was from, from, from Africa over North America, South America, Europe, uh, and a a Asian countries. But that's actually, that's, um, that's not a good evolution. And actually what was, what was wondering me the most was that the number was increasing. So it's going a little bit in the wrong direction. So we need to be very aware of the fact that you are really an independent institution. I give an example, in my country, in Belgium, is a supreme audit institution, the Rekenhof, doesn't receive her money from the government, but from the parliament. And that's actually a very interesting triangle that you are not depending only of the government side, and that's also the strength of the European Court of Auditors. Our main partner is the Comte Committee at the European Parliament. That's the first partner. 
And the commission is actually the partner where we want to obtain all the information then we need to. So with them, the relations are from time to time a little bit, there is more animosity in that relationship, but that's also quite normal. That's in, in the normal relationship between the Supreme Audit Institution and the commission. But it's logic that your resources on where your institution is based on cannot be touched by changing commission or government or by changing majority, because that's actually the key in independency and impartiality. So at this moment, I think in Europe it's quite okay, but you feel immediately, and two of you gave already the example of Turkey, it's true. If we have an audit on Turkey, on EU funds that go to Turkey, it's always, there is the threshold of obtaining information is higher than in other member states or in other countries. First of all, thank you for coming here today and giving us this great lecture. And yeah, coming back to the rule of law, I wanted to ask, uh, being that you said the Article 7, Article 258, and the new procedure proposed by the Commission, they are slow and sometimes not very efficient. Now, what um, my question is regarding what could bring new uh, the Court of Auditors to this uh, process? What can bring new the Court of Auditors to the mm -hmm. table in case get more access? Or... Yes. Thank well, you. Um, what was important for the European Commission to come with the third option? If there is uh, a lack in rule of law that they can link it to EU budget was that the two other options, the infringement procedure and the Article 2 procedure, the nuclear option, they are not very flexible, and there is, it's black or white, but there is not a lot of middle way, there is no gray zone. With this third option, they try to give um, a much flexible, more flexible instrument, and that also for the first time, it links it to the EU budget. What can contribute, what can the European Court of Auditors contribute to this? Well, first of all, we made our opinion on that proposal. And we said in our recommendations, we had five recommendations, you need to improve your text to be clear, because you don't want to have an, a new proposal on rule of law and not be clear, and maybe not be clear on the criteria you want to use, because that's not very consistent. So that's the first thing we did as a court of auditors. But mainly to guarantee is, of course, if we have, if we see during an audit that there is a suspicion, a suspicion of fraud, we have a procedure that we immediately send that file to OLAF, the anti-fraud institution in Europe. And then it's, of course, up to an independent anti-fraud institution to start an investigation if there is really enough content to bring it in front for a court, from a court, and now also with EPO, the European prosecutor, there will come another dynamic. But it's very important for us, if we see at a certain moment during our audit work, although the main, aud the main aim for the court of auditors is not trying to find fraud, our main aim is trying to find out, is the EU money, is the taxpayers' money well spent? That's also the reason why we come every year with an error rate, an error rate that figures out what is actually the potential, um, not abuse, not best spent uh, European money. So, but actually we have that system between OLAF and the Court of Auditors. If there is a suspicion of fraud, we send it to OLAF. OLAF can start an, uh, an investigation. If there is enough content in it, it can go to the courts or the courts at the member states, or the court at the European level, or they can come an out, a, a, a result can also be an administrative procedure. Some other question? Yes, just. Oh, it's, okay, just in the back. <laughs> Uh, good evening, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, how does the European Court of Auditors uh, deal with challenges of digitalization, and especially talking about technologies like blockchain, perhaps, or uh, in the field of e-commerce? 
I would be just interested in what, you, what you're doing. Thanks. Well, it's, it's, it's a priority, of course, at this moment of the Court of Auditors. So um, we have a work in, at the internal, internal level, a work group that deals with it. We are also in close relationship with universities, but also other institutions to see how we can work together because it's not only at the Court of Auditors, but I also know that European Investment Bank, European Investment Fund, they also all map what's important for blockchain, blockchain and artificial intelligence. For us, there's of course also another aspect and that's what I mentioned earlier. Who is going to audit the, the it's, no, we have two aspects of it. It's first of all the aspect of just our organization. Can we replace expensive audit hours by more machine work so that we have more audit hours to do, for example, performance audit. At this moment, at the Court of Auditors, 50% of our work is the annual uh, report, just the legality, financial and compliance audits. 50% is performance audit. That is uh, um, controlling the three E's and not only looking to did they follow the rule, but also is there a value Is there a value for money? Was there an added value with a certain project? Because you can follow the legality uh, in a, for a tender, but building solar panels at a place where there's no sun, that will come out in a performance audit rather than an annual report. We want to go for, uh, towards one third annual report in resources two-third performance audits, which means that uh, using technology can help us to check legality and regularity of transactions first. But then, of course, we have the second part. As more and more institutions and also European institutions will use at a certain moment blockchain and artificial intelligence, we also need to be prepared to audit these processes. Um, I think the examples we saw on artificial intelligence are from time to time amazing if you look to certain sectors, but we also know that the algorithms can uh, just go contrary to, 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 to rule of law or to, to equality between men and women, because if you, if you, for example, make an algorithm out of who, what is the type of persons who are member of boards of big companies, then the gender balance will not move in the good direction because you are based on data from the past and these data are not, of course, not in favor. So that will be, that will be a, a very important topic for us. And we work on it. We had all, we had all, I think two, three days ago, we had an, a whole day seminar on blockchain. What are the possibilities, the opportunities, also the difficulties. But honestly, we are, we are pretty, we are not working on it, but of course, we are not there. Some other question? No, okay, so I might have, oh, okay, just go on. Hi, um, I have two questions regarding the, um, the proposal by the commission. The, the first is, does the rule of law that is enforced in the commission's proposal only apply to the management of funds, or is it the general rule of law, for example, if journalists are treated uh, without the, the bounds of, of the law? And the sec second question is a bit more political. Do you think that the Commission's proposal can, um, can bring countries such as Poland to, to cooperate and bring them back on the right track, or does it risk to further antagonize mm -hmm. them as with the, the nuclear procedure? Mm. Well, on the first uh, answer, the third proposal links it to EU funds. The two other options who are already existing are more general. If there is a deficiency in rule of law, there can be the infringement procedure or the so-called nuclear option. That's not linked to EU budget. That is just if at a certain moment commission thinks there is a problem, there is an alarm bell that rings, they can start one of the two procedures. It's only the third proposal what, and that's still a proposal that uh, links it to the EU budget. That's the only one. Uh, on your second question, 
will it have the good results? Because actually, what do you want? You don't want to punish for punishing. You just want to punish to improve something. That's actually the basic line. It's not only in EU, EU institutions, but it's, it's always you want to obtain the good result. That's the reason why we wrote in our opinion that uh, we had special attention for the final beneficiaries, because if decreasing EU fund is hurting final beneficiaries, how will the final beneficiary react? Is he going to oppose more against Europe? Or is he going to oppose more against the national government and saying, hey, it's due to you that I don't have any more this EU fund? Honestly, I cannot give an answer to that because it's, it can go both directions. I think it's too early to, to, but the hope is of course, and the intention of everybody is of course, to bring it in the good direction. And that's the reason why I referred at a certain moment to that um, uh, cooperation uh, and verification mechanism that European Commission set up with Bulgaria and Romania where they said you have to implement certain judicial reforms, and if you go towards the good part, then you will become, then we will control you less. So it's a very, how shall I say, uh, mechanism to improve the situation and not a punishment mechanism. Here I know that also the Commission emphasizes that this is not a punishing mechanism, but a mechanism to improve the situation. It will be after, of course, it will be afterwards if the mechanism has been approved because it is not yet like that and it's used, then afterwards we will, can, we will be able to make that analysis. At this moment, I think, honestly, it can go two ways and it's not clear to, uh, to me which way it will be. All right, any other question? No, okay, so I'm going to abuse the situation. I'm going to ask a question. I mean, uh, in the last report by uh, the European Court of Editors, the president of uh, the court said that uh, the EU should not generate expectation which cannot be achieved. He says that, but it didn't go to the hand of the logic uh, because the hand would be either you do less or we should increase the EU budget. And if you look at economic studies, usually they say that the EU budget should be at least uh, for uh, up to 9% of GNI uh, to be comparable to the budget you, can, you may find in some of the federation. And so I just wanted to know your opinion about it. Well, what we see in our, because you refer at this moment to our annual report, what we see, I and mean, this really a very good evolution, is that the error rate is decreasing every year. And we, um, we, we, we see it going in the good direction. This means that the work of the Court of Auditors pushes the European Commission also their internal audit or bodies to really work on administrative sanctions if taxpayers' money is abused. Because of course the Commission wants to be proud of the fact that most of the taxpayers' money is really, and it's not most, it's like 97% is really well spent. That's very giving a lot of confidence. Of course, why our president said that is because at a certain moment there are announcements of new programs, but you need to be aware, it was a little bit a um, uh, kind warning of that there is not an expectation gap, that you don't, that the commission doesn't give the feeling to people. We, we are now able to find a solution for everything, although you can only find a solution for 50%. But that's always the dynamic, as I come from, a, that as I was in my uh, previous positions, a politician, it's always something where you need to deal with it. You want to be um, positive and optimistic and change things. But of course, you need to put your expectations on the good part. And it's normal as a court of auditors that we warn for that, because at a certain moment, we will do the audits. And we will check, certainly in our performance audits, we will check the efficiency. We will check if the money was well spent, not only on financial and compliance point of view, but also from a performance point of view. So 
I think at this moment it is not problematic, mm -hmm. but it's also good at the Court of Auditors that we that we say what we think after the 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 after our our strong audit work that we do. Okay, thanks very much. I got the last question, if I may help you. I mean, five years ago, you had a former president of the European Council, uh, Hermann von Rompuy, uh, who said that the European Court of Auditors uh, should turn down its criticism uh, of uh, EU budget um, spending uh, to avoid negative uh, press coverage. Uh, and I mean, luckily for uh, the Court of Auditors, you had Devin Cameron, who came to, to the rescue, and so that uh, what the president of the European Council was saying was nonsense. And so I was wondering, uh, what's your position? Because I mean, considering the current situation, uh, it's not easy for you, uh, especially since Brits are leaving, so nobody left to rescue you, I'm afraid. Uh, nobody left to work? To rescue uh, the European Court of Auditors, I'm um, afraid. Well, it, it, uh, I, will, I will answer on this question in a very personal way. In, um, I had uh, the fantastic opportunity to be 15 years a politician, and out of that, eight years uh, a minister, six years a minister of security, eh? first migration, then home affairs, then justice. I was for six years a member of the Justice and Home Affairs Council, and I presided it in, now I need to think, I think second half of 2000. Yeah, second half of 2010. Very interesting experience, I have to say, um, where you have to deal from time to time with uh, a negotiation process among 28 member states. That's not always, and certainly migration areas and security areas. There is, um, we had an interesting talk on that uh, with, uh, with your rector. Um, uh, it, it was a very interesting period, but after a certain moment, it's also a moment to think, what do I want to, what's the next step in my life? And after 15 years, I'm actually, I think, if you are a certain period in a very intensive job, it's not bad to move on. And after I left government, I really took some time to reflect what do I want to do? Because I still liked politics, but I didn't want to go further with it just like because I was there. And then I thought for myself, if there is at a certain moment an opportunity in international organization, I will be open for it. Um, and I'm very happy with this opportunity. I'm appointed by my government, but after that we also did a European procedure, which helps a lot on, on making the change from a politician to um, a court of auditors. And actually I have to say that the preparation of the, of the hearing was very helpful to me because it, it, it reflects in that period, in that preparation also, you have another job. And uh, it's close to European politics, but to be in the driver's seat, been there, done that, fantastic period, I can recommend it to everybody if you hesitate to go in politics. <laughs> After you worked at the Court of Auditors, of course, no. Honestly, it's, it's very in interesting. If you hesitate on going in politics, do it. It's the best way to change the society. Um, so for me, it's, it's uh, and I can use my expertise that I had in politics also at the Court of Auditors. And which is very interesting among the members of the European Court of Auditors that we have a very good mix among former members, uh, former politicians, but also people who come from the academic world, people who come from audit world, and that gives a very good dynamic inside the court of auditors. All right, thanks very much. Any other question? No? Okay, so thanks very much for your interesting speech. Uh, really learn a lot, thanks.